Hi again. In this section of the workshop, we're going to be examining space-time hot and cold spot trends. We'll focus on two variables, daily new COVID-19 case counts and daily new COVID-19 case rates, new cases per 100,000 people. We'll examine the space-time hotspot trends for both of these variables as 2D summary maps, and we'll also look at the data in 3D. As you remember, we can explore the cube data in 3D by running the Visualize Space-Time Cube in 3D tool, but as we saw before, this isn't a very effective way to identify broad patterns. A better approach is to use one of the space-time analysis tools to extract patterns and trends. And in this part of the workshop, we're going to be focusing on the Emerging Hotspot Analysis tool. But first, let's take a look at how the tool works. The Emerging Hotspot Analysis tool visits each bin in the space-time cube and it looks at its value and the values of the bins around it, both its spatial neighbors and its temporal neighbors. In this graphic, the space-time neighborhood consists of each county's closest eight neighbors in space for both the current and the previous four-week time period. And the tool assesses, are the values in this bin and its neighboring bins significantly different from the values for all the bins in the cube? The tool processes each bin in the context of its neighboring bins, categorizing it as having similar values, significantly higher values, or significantly lower values than the cube as a whole. It assesses how clustered the values in the neighborhood are and whether the clustering of either high or low values is statistically significant at the 90, 95, or 99% confidence level. Each bin is assigned a category. Remember that each column, each location in the cube actually represents a county and the bins at the top of the column are the most recent time steps while the bins at the bottom of the column are the oldest time steps. And if the tool stopped here, well, we'd sure be in trouble because it's still really difficult to identify patterns and trends from all this data. Fortunately, the tool helps us out here. After classifying each bin in the cube as a statistically significant hotspot with 99% confidence or a statistically significant cold spot with 90% confidence or a bin where there's no statistically significant clustering and so forth, it categorizes the values in each column based on the pattern of hot and cold spots it contains, and it assigns one of 17 different trends to each column. Let's look at these a little more closely. Notice the column highlighted in the corner of the cube. This location is classified as a sporadic hotspot. The pattern is on again, then off again. Notice how in the first couple time periods at the bottom of the cube, it's a statistically significant hotspot, but then it isn't, but then it is again, but then it isn't, and in the last most recent time step, it is a statistically significant hotspot. For the next door column, if you look from the bottom to the top of the column, you can see that the location isn't a statistically significant hotspot until the most recent time period at the top of the cube. This type of trend is classified as a new hotspot. For this column, the values are sometimes cold and sometimes hot. Since the most recent time period is hot, the location is classified as an oscillating hotspot. If the most recent time period was cold, it would have been classified as an oscillating cold spot. Each of the emerging space-time patterns is listed and described here in the handout and also in the tool documentation. And this many categories is definitely overwhelming. But in most cases, you'll probably only be interested in a couple of these. For the COVID-19 data, for example, we'll probably want to focus on the new, consecutive, and intensifying hotspots. When we run the Emerging Hotspot Analysis tool, we get a map showing if any of these 17 patterns were found in the cube columns. Let's run the tool and see what we get for the COVID-19 daily case data. To run the tool, the first parameter you'll provide is the path to the space-time cube, and I call the cube COVID new case cube. Then we need to select the variable we want to analyze. Let's start with the new cases per 100,000 people, the rate variable. We'll also provide a path name for the output feature layer. Here I've named it new case rate trends. Next, you'll choose a conceptualization of spatial relationships. What the heck is that? <laughs> That's really just how you define a neighborhood, and it should be based on your best guess about how the features, counties in the, this case, 
how the features interact with each other. Since COVID-19 spreads person to person, the ideal conceptualization of spatial relationships would be something reflecting the amount of spatial interaction that occurs among counties. Our options here are fixed distance, K nearest neighbors, and contiguity. We'll select contiguity edges only, guessing that spatial interaction might be highest between counties that share a border. Next, we define which bins are included as temporal neighbors. Our time step is four weeks. We said that counties that share a border are neighbors, and by setting the neighborhood time step to one, so are those same bins in the previous time step. Finally, you'll select the global window. I said the tool compares each bin and its neighboring bins to all bins in the cube. Well, I lied just a little bit. There are actually three choices for what the tool compares the neighborhood values to. The entire cube, the neighborhood time step, or the individual time step. When you choose entire cube, each bin and its neighbors are compared to all the values on all the bins for the entire cube. And this is generally not a good choice when there's a strong trend in the data like we have here. For the COVID-19 case data, we know there were very few cases initially, then more, and finally lots of cases. The global mean for the whole cube is therefore a middle value. The lows at the beginning of the outbreak are averaged with the highs at the end of the year, producing a middle value that all bin neighborhoods will be compared to. A bin neighborhood at the bottom of the cube will be a cold spot because there are no cases yet. A bin in the middle of the cube will look a lot like the, mean, the, the global mean value, and a bin at the top of the cube will be a hot spot compared to the global mean. And that's what we see. The counties that show up as new hotspots got to the party late, staying below the overall average case rate until the very last time period when they exceeded the average case rate. The counties shown in consecutive hotspots got to the party a little sooner uh, than the new hotspot areas, and then they too had values exceeding the average case rate for the last several time periods. And the oscillating hotspot counties started off cold with much lower case rates than the average, but then caught up to everyone else. The white counties didn't express a strong trend and were about the same as the average case rate in the last time period. Let's look at what happens when we use a different global window. When you choose to use the neighborhood time step global window, you're comparing each bin to all other bins in the same phase of the COVID outbreak. So a bin in the first part of the outbreak is only compared to all other bins in the first part of the outbreak. Bins in the last part of the outbreak are only compared to all other bins in the last part of the outbreak. By removing the dominant trend, we can focus on how counties compare to each other during the same phase of the outbreak, which seems like a more um, valuable analysis for the COVID data. The emerging hotspot analysis categories put the most focus on the last time period. Consequently, if the last time period in the county has case rates the same as everyone else, usually no trend is detected. We do see some trends here, however. Again, the new hotspots had rates similar to everyone else until the most recent phase of the outbreak, when they exceeded the average case rate. We see counties shown as sporadic hotspots, meaning they exceeded the average case rates, then matched, then exceeded, on again, off again. The consecutive cold spots had lower case rates than other counties, but only for the last several time periods. Let's look at one more global window option. The individual time step is like taking a snapshot of the data at each time period. Each bin is only compared to all other neighboring bins in the exact same four-week time window. If we want to take action to reduce the number of new COVID cases, this is probably the most appropriate global window for our analysis because it factors out the broad overall trends and focuses on patterns in the most recent time period. Here the tool does pick up a large number of trends, and we can use these trends to guide policy. In the new hotspot areas, for example, it might be time to double down on social distancing, mask mandates, and limiting large gatherings. In counties that are new cold spots, on the other hand, it might be time to begin making plans for relaxing restrictions. It's helpful to view the 3D scene of the hot and cold spot classifications on top of the 2D map as shown here. This helps you really see how the different categories have been assigned. The map on the left shows new COVID case rate trends. The map on the right shows the same analysis for new COVID case counts. 
Looking at counts is most important when we want to answer resource allocation types of questions. For our purposes, if we were running this analysis in January of this year, for example, we would notice that Chicago has been a hotspot for new COVID case counts throughout the pandemic. In the past couple months, most of Arizona, Dallas, and Miami have been hotspots for high case counts as well. And in Orange County, California, the case counts are intensifying. These are places we would want to make sure we have sufficient resources like testing, healthcare staff, PPEs, and COVID care facilities. In this session, we learned about the Emerging Hotspot Analysis Tool and all of its parameter options. We used it to analyze both COVID new case counts and case rates.